my name is Heinz Kurz. I'm from the University of Graz and I have the great pleasure and uh, indeed the honor to introduce to you Per Molander, who's a highly distinguished uh, colleague and uh, very politically active and widely known uh, in the field, not only in academia, but also in politics. Uh, he's a Swedish advisor to politicians, uh, a social economic theorist and author, a very versatile author, by the way. His main field of research are problems of income and wealth distribution. He studied at the Sorbonne French literature and cultural history, but also mathematics and continued his studies at the University of Lund, where he also um, got his first uh, degree, his bachelor degree. He then followed uh, studies in applied physics. During his um, uh, military service, he acted as a translator and interpreter for Russian, interestingly enough. Uh, in 1979, uh, he did his uh, PhD at the Technical University of Lund in applied mathematics. He was um, uh, involved in a uh, uh, research project at the University of Groningen and uh, from 1980 until 1988, um, he was a system analyst um, with the National Swedish uh, Defense Research Institute. He then became a chief analyst of a parliamentary working group dealing with uh, uh, food supply, again a hot key, uh, topic given the war in the Ukraine and its uh, tremendous uh, effects. Uh, he worked uh, in the 1990s for the Swedish government uh, as an advisor on reforms of the welfare and budget policy and environmental policy. He was an advisor also to the World Bank, to the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission and further institutions. Um, he was uh, the Vice President of Transparency International in Sweden from 2006 to 2009. In 2009, he founded the Inspections uh, of uh, Social Insurances of the Swedish Government and was its General Director until 2015. Since 2013, he is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. As I've already mentioned, he uh, published a number of books dealing with political issues, most importantly, uh, issues of income distribution. Uh, in this regard, he was stimulated by his studies as a student of Nash Equilibria and began to investigate uh, the problem of uh, inequality in society. Um, he is convinced uh, that one of the reasons for inequality is that very often in, such, in societies, the stronger uh, ones become stronger, the weaker ones become weaker, the richer ones richer, and the poorer ones poorer. I think this is almost a, a quotation from uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, second uh, discourse published in 1755, Discourse upon the Origin and Foundations of the Inequality of Mankind, and there will certainly be able to say something about this, this connection. Now, what he describes there are self-reinforcing effects. Inequality breeds inequality. Uh, whereas equally powerful parties would distribute a given asset in equal parts, Differently powerful parties will typically allocate a smaller portion to the less powerful party. Um, and this, I think, is perhaps also one of the reasons why in this war in the Ukraine currently, the Ukrainians are not willing as yet uh, to properly discuss a, a peace because uh, uh, having lost some of their um, lands uh, because of that uh, attack by the Russians, they would be in a, in a difficult position um, at the table of nego negotiations. Societies imbued by a social democratic spirit, Per 
Melander seems to argue, tend to be more just and also stable. Now he investigates concrete issues of distributive justice and puts forward policy recommendations to curb um, the trend towards greater and greater inequality. Now, just a few remarks on um, the fact that the issue of income distribution was high on the agenda. Actually, even before um, Rousseau, whom I mentioned earlier, just think about uh, Thomas Hobbes and others. It plays a tremendous role in uh, the classical economists. Uh, I am thinking about Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who devoted uh, lengthy uh, disquisitions on sources of inequality. And let me just remind you of Adam Smith, who pointed out that uh, there is human capital, different uh, um, uh, accumulations of human capital that play a role, the scarcity of talents, utilization of labor in the sense of the constancy of employment plays a role, trust in workers plays a role. I mean, if you have very, very um, uh, expensive machinery, then sabotage is very costly and you might wish to pay an extra a premium in order for workers to behave properly. Risk, et cetera, et cetera. In most recent times, of course, uh, the issue is uh, whether uh, artificial intelligence systems favor certain parts of society to the detriment of others. And the argument there by uh, authors such as Stiglitz and others is that uh, since we cannot know what the effects of of technological change are in advance, I mean, income distribution would have to be, it does not make sense to pretend to be able to decide these issues already uh, prior to uh, the coming of uh, the novelty. That is all. Now, I would like to ask Pierre to uh, give his talk on the origins of inequality, a highly timely topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heinz, for this uh, introduction. Well, um, as Heinz said, I have a background in in engineering, uh, control theory to be exact. And in those circles, uh, it's uh, uh, almost self-evident that if you want to control a system, you must start by um, studying its proper dynamics. Uh, I've been somewhat fascinated by reading a lot of literature on normative literature on inequality. Um, which has virtually no content uh, uh, which is analytical, I mean, which discusses how society works in the absence of um, interventions. Uh, and um, what I try to accomplish by writing this book and my previous work is to, to um, contribute somewhat to the analytical literature so that the normative discussion on inequality, whether you are for or against it, is based on, on a proper understanding of, of the social mechanisms at work. Um, we have to start by the some stylized facts uh, on inequality. And um, <clears throat> the first is that the inequality is ubiquitous. Uh, all societies that we know uh, are characterized by some degree of inequality. Uh, anthropologists who have studied uh, hunter-gatherer societies would tell you that they are uh, highly egalitarian. Uh, but there's a simple explanation for that, namely that these societies live close to existence minimum, so there is no room for inequality. For inequality to develop, you, you need a surplus. Uh, and so you see potentially a higher level of inequality in societies where there's a large surplus. The second basic fact is that inequality tends to grow over time. Uh, the diagram you see here is uh, from a rather recent publication by Italian economic historian Guido Alfani, the University of Bocconi. Um, uh, this is sort of a weighted 
uh, inequality of a number of European um, regions uh, from the year 1300 to uh, 2015, basically. Uh, and what you see here um, is uh, a rise up to the mid 14th century and then a drastic drop in inequality. And then after about 100 years, the previous trend resumes and uh, continues up till just after the turn of the century 1900, when there is again a drop until around 1980. And then the original uh, development resumes. And um, the explanation for the drop around 1350 is, of course, uh, the Black Death, uh, when Europe lost between one third and half of its population. So there was a shortage of labor, and, and that strengthened the negotiation position of, of the labor versus the feudal lords. Um, um, and then you see the, the uh, sort of standard development they're working for um, four or five hundred years. Um, after 1900, there was no Black Death. Uh, the explanation is rather um, organization, labor and, and general suffrage. Um, and then uh, we can have some different opinions of what happened around 1980, but there again we see the the basic tendency of growing inequality to to resume. And the third stylized fact that a theory about inequality needs to explain is that the inequality is socially dependent. Um, if you ask a managing director of a large corporation here in Europe or or in the United States. Um, um, why, I mean, what justifies his or her high salary, they will refer to their own performance, uh, talent, uh, effort, etc. Uh, but if you move this person to Central Africa in a country with non-functioning infrastructure, labor with a substantially lower level of education and so on, the performance of this person will drop drastically. So, so whatever we accomplish, that is socially dependent. And any theory... Um, may I just no? ask for clarification? What is the meaning of 70 or 80 or 90? Uh, the, 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 the measure, okay, the measure of inequality. Uh, it's the fraction of total assets in society owned by the upper 10%. Uh, but if you had if you had used the Gini coefficient instead, you would get the same general. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be clear because I think you hadn't mentioned it. Mm. Okay, so um, we should try to explain these basic facts. Um, just a few words first about the question: What's an explanation? Um, and I tried uh, an analogy here uh, to illustrate um, from a non-political area, namely oscillating systems. Um, for instance, uh, we see oscillations of temperature around us every day over the year and over a longer period. Now, there is a simple explanation for that, and that's the, the rotation of, of the globe. Um, so the insulation varies, uh, um, and that's fairly trivial in a sense, um, that uh, if you have an, a strong external force acting upon a system which oscillates, then the, the system behavior will also oscillate with that. Um, the second category um, is less trivial um, and I picked there the example of, of Karman vortices. Uh, if you have a stream of smoke, as in this picture, which passes um, an, an obstacle, which is at the, the upper edge of there, uh, there will form a, uh, an oscillating pattern downstream this uh, obstacle. 
um, which is non-trivial, of course, because there's nothing oscillating about the external force here. So you need a fairly complex mathematical theory involving Hopf-like bifurcations and then some turbulence theory to explain that. Um, actually, I have a short film uh, which illustrates that this is not only mathematics or laboratory, but real life. Uh, it's a short film of 10 seconds, which I uh, made um, outside my home here. Uh, you see a reed in the middle of the picture, which is moving. And the, the fascinating thing is that, that the reed is moving in a plane which is perpendicular to the, to the current, um, uh, which is highly non-trivial. The third category of, of oscillations um, is where you have a system which generates oscillations by itself. There's no external force acting upon it. And one example is the, the famous uh, hair links oscillations uh, in, the, the, in um, Canada, um, where the, the populations of hair and links oscillate uh, together um, and you need some sort of um, Lotka Volterra equations to, to explain that pattern. Um, my intention before I finish this lecture is to show that these three categories are relevant also for inequality. You have some, the first category is where inequality is inherited from outside, in, in a sense, a trivial category. Uh, then there is a second category where inequality is generated from outside, but not, uh, I mean, the inequality is not imposed on the system. The inequality is generated from the interaction between the system and this external um, action. And then there is the third category, which is perhaps the most uh, intriguing and fascinating, where inequality is generated and for, from the system itself um, uh, with no external intervention. So um, what tools do we need? Well, first we have to decide what, what to study. Um, inequality of what? Inequality of knowledge, capabilities, health, income assets, for example. And then we need some measure of inequality and uh, the literature is, of course, dominated by the Gini coefficient, um, which I find a bit sad because it's a highly blunt uh, measure of inequality. Um, I illustrated this in, in two diagrams. Uh, to the left, you see the, the, the definition of the Gini coefficient. Uh, you line up all the, the inhabitants of the population from left to right, and then you start accumulating their, say, their incomes, if we are talking about incomes. Um, and uh, when you reach the right point, you have the whole population and you have the whole um, sum of incomes. Um, and if everybody had the same income, that would have been the straight line, the diagonal from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And the Gini coefficient is the area of this, this shaded area, which is between the actual uh, distribution and, and the ideal um, totally equal distribution divided by the area of the triangle. So it's a, it's a, a number between zero and one. Uh, zero means uh, full equality. One means full inequality in the sense that everybody, uh, that only one person has the, the uh, full income. Now, to the right, you see two societies which are highly different. Uh, in society A, 40% uh, of the population uh, together dispose of 1% of the income, and the rest of the population um, has the rest equally distributed. This could be, for instance, um, an old colony uh, with the Aboriginal population oppressed by the colonizers. Uh, and society B, you have uh, a small ruling elite which controls 40% of the incomes, uh, but 
which corresponds only to 1% of the population and the rest of the population shares the rest. Um, and of course, these two societies are highly different. Uh, you can't expect the same behavior from these two societies. And yet they have the same Gini coefficient by the definition to the left. So the general message from this is that a lot of the literature um, which uses the Gini coefficient as the sole indicator of inequality is not very interesting. It's simply too blunt a measure. And in, in order to generate more interesting results, you need more detailed measures in most cases. Um, dynamic, dynamical systems uh, are obviously relevant. Um, I, I pretend that any intelligent theory about inequality needs to be dynamical. And of course, stability or instability is, is central to, to this. Uh, I have this simple illustration here for those of you who are not um, brainwashed with mathematical theory of inequality. To the left, you have what's called a roly poly doll, so a small wooden doll with the metal blob at the bottom. And if you push this ball, it will always return to the upright position. So that's a stable equilibrium. Whereas on the right, you have a pencil. If you try to place a pencil on the tip, it will always fall, no matter how you, how you try and how skillful you are, because that's an unstable equilibrium. And that's basically all you need to know about stability and instability. Um, which will be central to the presentation later. I use some game theory also, not too complicated. Um, evolutionary game theory is to be preferred because the sort of classical based on computations is in most cases intractable and, and, and not very useful for, for behavioral uh, analysis. Um, negotiation, negotiation theory based on, on Nash um, theory from, from the mid 20th century. Um, now, I, I use three different perspectives in order to um, systematize and sort this, this voluminous literature there is that you find. And the first perspective is the individual one, the, the life cycle of one individual, where you start uh, at birth or even before that at conception, because a lot of things can happen uh, during the embryonic stage and, and um, uh, at the fetus stage. Uh, and you follow that till uh, retirement or, or death. In, in, in that perspective, you have to reduce the social background to something very simple. Um, it's always there, but, but uh, if, if you focus on the individual, you need to reduce the complexity of, of the surrounding society. In the, in the second perspective, uh, we reverse that. We reduce individuals uh, to um, maybe identical individuals to simplify and focus on the social mechanisms that tend to generate inequality. And the third perspective is spatial. Uh, we look at geographic space and how economic activities are distributed over, over geographic space because there is uh, always inequality in that dimension as well. So let's start with the first perspective, which is the life cycle. Uh, and we, when you read that literature, you find there's a total dominance for the capital metaphor. Um, people who study uh, education, um, uh, working life, uh, uh, salaries, etc. Uh, they all center on something they call human capital, which is sort of the, the sum total of our capacities, cogniz cognitive as well as non-cognitive. Uh, then there is also a health capital, uh, which similarly may grow or 
or diminished depending on circumstances. Uh, and the third common category is social capital, which is somewhat more vague, um, has a more recent history, and, and there are several definitions more or less formalized around. Now, the, the common thing about all these capital descriptions is that they um, uh, obey a similar mathematical growth formula, uh, which was formalized uh, by the French statistician Gibra uh, around 1930 in some uh, important paper and a book, um, where he simply, well, he studied a lot of empirical distributions of uh, city sizes, firm sizes, incomes, etc., and found a, a common pattern, which he explained by, by this equation that uh, growth during a time period, say during a year, uh, can be assumed to be proportional to the stock at time t. For instance, if you have a population of, of a city, you have a certain uh, nativity and you have mortality, so the net nativity um, you assume constant in the in the basic model. Now, of course, there will always be um, uh, stochastic uh, occurrences, uh, baby booms or, or um, epidemics and so on, and so you need this stochastic factor, which is epsilon. And with this simple assumption, you get uh, this uh, second equation now for the development of the distribution, which yields a log normal distribution. That is the, the logarithm of what you uh, are studying is, has a normal distribution. Um, and that almost gives the answer where inequality, inequality comes from in this perspective because whatever indicator of inequality you use the coefficient of variation or the skewness or the gini coefficient they will tell you that inequality grows without bounds for a class of phenomena that obeys this this principle of Gibra. Uh, i have a diagram here which shows um, the time development um, we assume at time zero uh, at the far back of the diagram that we have a spike, a, a very narrow distribution, uh, and then time development is shown uh, along this axis. Uh, you can think, for instance, of a school class, a uh, class of pupils who enter school, and you have a fair narrow distribution. All pupils know actually, well, approximately the same things when, when entering school, and then they are subject to an info, information flow um, in, in, in school um, in the sense that the, the teacher is talking or they are seeing a film or they are reading books or whatever. Now, not all information will translate into knowledge because for information to, to become knowledge, you need some some link to the existing knowledge that the pupil in question has. Uh, it's, it's like hitting a target. Um, and of course, the, it's very likely that the probability of hitting a target is uh, proportional to the size of the target. So you have this, in this simple case, um, reason to believe that the Jumeirah's principle um, is relevant. And what happens here is you can see that as time increases, this uh, probability distribution gets smeared out over the whole axis. So uh, the average will tend to infinity, uh, but the, the spread goes even faster, which is why the, the level of inequality will also grow without bounds. Um, so much for data and mathematics. So what do the data say? Um, well, I have a few examples here. Uh, the left diagram here shows um, aptitude scores in, in American schools. 
um, and um, you have the scores for four classes pertaining to to the four quartiles um, and uh, what you can see here is a sort of fan shaped pattern that the spread increases with time as they pass from from age five to age 14 so that seems to follow this Jira pattern in the right diagram uh, you see uh, the same picture for for the health uh, dimension although the fan here con consists of only two feathers um, you have the top quartile this is the lower curve and the the uh, bottom quartile the low income earners okay? and high values um, imply worse health status um, and you can see here that the the spread uh, increases with time between the the well-off and the low-income earners up to the age of retirement when the curves start to converge again as a result of natural aging so this spread is actually a function of of, of work life uh, salaries um, summarize our capacities in all respects cognitive or non-cognitive abilities health and a lot of other things social networks so we should expect something similar and and you can see that this picture confirmed here when we follow a cohort from the age of 20 to the age of 58 these are american data uh, you see this again this fan-shaped pattern with increasing spread um, now of course Gibraltar's uh, e equation um, is valid for for people with infinite longevity and, and human beings are mortal so uh, what happens uh, between generations is important to the level of inequality um, and here are the main determinants of this this transfer uh, the type of economy with a primitive economy of hunter-gatherers or horticultural or pastoral to industrial and to these different types correspond uh, different dominant capital forms whether human social or produced capital is is the dominant form and of course physical or financial capital is very easy to inherit you just transfer from one generation to the next whereas human capital for instance uh, requires much more labor so so you should expect um, a less efficient transfer from one generation to the next in a, in a society where human capital is the dominant capital form and of course the legal framework is also important um, in inheritance legislation and so on um, strong engine intergenerational transfers correlate with high inequality this is called the great gatsby curve in in the jargon uh, people working in this area um, and this is a fairly natural thing to expect if if parents transfer a lot to their kids that will generate high inequality so causal links go in both directions okay so much for the individual perspective let's turn to the second perspective then and, and focus on social mechanisms and i have listed uh, a handful here um, ranging from the simplest society consisting of two parties bilateral negotiations you, this could be between robinson crusoe and friday or between landowners and and uh, agriculture workers or labor and capital um, and then we have somewhat larger groups uh, uh, imitation herd behavior is important discrimination um, segregation uh, networks intermediate size um, social interaction patterns and then finally markets where millions of people can interact and uh, in all these um, you can find uh, 
generators of inequality. But of course, the mechanisms are different depending on what type of interaction you're studying. Uh, I won't have time to go through all this, but I'll just show a few examples uh, to illustrate the, the basic mechanisms. So let's start with the, the bilateral uh, negotiation. Now, if you have two parties, say capital and labor, uh, uh, they meet once a year to negotiate uh, how to distribute the value added produced during the previous year. Um, and uh, if they are equally strong when they sit down at the negotiation table, uh, they will get one half each by symmetry. And that was one of John Nash's um, basic axioms for his theory. Um, but if one of the parties is somewhat stronger than the other, um, that party will get a little more than one half of the, the quantity negotiated. And so we should expect that party to return to the next round a year later or a month later, um, even more equipped with, with the negotiation strength. And so there is a self-reinforcing mechanism um, that would lead us to expect instability from this um, egalitarian equilibrium where the parties are equally strong. And I have illustrated this in this diagram where we start with one party having 1% more assets than the other. And um, you see the, the development here over time. Uh, rather slowly, before, but then after some time it accelerates and, and in the end the, the weaker party runs out of assets and, and is dependent on the goodwill of the stronger party for survival, uh, which this stronger party could, could be interested in, of course, uh, to use this the weaker party as labor. Um, so this is intuitively uh, natural, but it's no, not always true. So this is not trivial. Uh, there is a necessary and sufficient co con condition for this uh, development to hold, and that is that the absolute risk aversion, uh, as defined by Arrow and Pratt um, many decades ago, uh, is strictly decreasing in, in, um, in the assets. Um, uh, which means that the, 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 each part is prepared to take higher risks if um, the assets are, are greater, which is natural, but not necessarily true in, in all situations. But the empirical literature is very clear on this point. This is most often satisfied. So this is the pattern that we should expect. Now, we could turn to, to the hawk dub game, which illustrates a slightly more antagonistic pattern of interaction than, than negotiation. Uh, we have two parties um, that uh, should share um, a, a quantity. And if they cooperate, if they use the dub strategy, they share equally. But uh, they could also play hawk, be aggressive. And if one part is aggressive and the other is weak, uh, the hawk takes the whole asset. So it pays to be aggressive. But if, if a hawk meets another hawk, um, they will again share equally, but they, they will also pay the price of fighting, which is greater. So there is a net loss when a hawk meets a hawk. And this is, an, uh, is a standard game in, in simple game, game theory. And that leads to stable equilibrium where both parties play hawk sometimes, play dove sometimes, and then you end up in this um, equilibrium in, in the middle, which is stable. Now, assume that this population is heterogeneous, um, that you could distinguish one group from another, for instance, skin color or some religious indicators, um, then you get a more complex situation. And um, it's pictured in the diagram here. The, the diagonal in this 
square corresponds to the previous straight line in the homogeneous case. Um, but what happens now when you have uh, heterogeneity is that the, the what was previously a stable equilibrium becomes unstable and you get the saddle point instead and you will converge to either this upper left corner or the lower right corner, which one depends on, on, on um, uh, random effects. Um, so the simple addition of heterogeneity uh, gives rise to discrimination, which need not have anything to do with productivity or any other relevant uh, dimension. Uh, and finally, um, on this list, I take the other extreme, a very large uh, social interaction network, a market. I, we imagine a society with uh, millions of inhabitants who are all identical in, in all important respects, that they are equally competent, they are equally willing to work and they have the same risk aversion. Um, and they work in this society and they produce a surplus, uh, which they place on the financial market. Some part of this uh, surplus they put in a bank, uh, safe placement with a very low interest rate, and then uh, the rest they put in the stock market, which is riskier, but also gives a, a higher payoff. Uh, but the, the division between risky and, and non-risky assets is the same at time zero for all these people because they have the same degree of risk aversion as we assumed. Now, what happens after a year is that some people were lucky in year one in, in choosing the stock portfolio. Uh, so they got the somewhat higher uh, payoff than the average and others were less lucky and got somewhat lower payoff. And so they will have to adjust their portfolios. And, and again, if we assume that um, people are prepared to take somewhat higher risks when their assets grow, the, those who were lucky in year one will choose a, a riskier portfolio in year two. And they will be rewarded for that by a higher payoff also in year two, whereas the opposite holds for the other uh, less lucky category. So you see the same self-reinforcing effect here in, in this society. And if you uh, allow this system to develop according to its own dynamics, uh, you will get a Gini coefficient that tends to one, as you see here in, in the diagram. And if you use the share of total wealth of the upper per percent, uh, you will get the same development. So that's independent of the choice of indicator. So again, we have this symmetry breaking uh, that you start from identical conditions for all citizens. Um, they are equally uh, competent, equally willing to work, etc. But you end up with a highly asymmetric situation in, in which one household owns the whole society. Well, finally, the, the third perspective, spatial inequality. Um, there are again some general stylized facts which you should keep in mind. Uh, in the first place, you, you, you should be aware that spatial and individual equality are, are independent at the aggregate level. Um, I can illustrate that with Swedish economic history during the last 150 years or so, where um, in the first period between 1860 and 1990, we had decreasing regional inequality, but increasing individual inequality. And then the following period, from the First World War to the Second World War, the, we were, the reverse held. And then we had a period between the Second World War and 1980 when inequality was decreasing in both respects, which uh, was completely reversed then around 1980 when um, inequality started to increase in both uh, respects. So these 
two dimensions are independent. That you find the same positive feedback and symmetry breaking effects uh, in, in spatial inequality as I have illustrated before for, for um, individual and, and um, social inequality. Um, there is also a, a, a nice uh, special literature on, on the distribution of city sizes. Um, if you line up the cities of a country, you will find almost always a, a similar pattern like the one uh, shown here in the diagram. Uh, it's from Sweden. Um, you have a, sort of the large portion of, of cities or municipalities which follow such a, a curve which is uh, which reflects a log normal distribution but then for the largest handful of cities um, uh, they are larger than you would expect from from uh, Gibra's principle um, and so th that's what um, what is called a scale free distribution for for the this category of large cities and this is a very stable pattern which has generated a, a large literature um, what happens is is that the 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 largest cities are they grow faster than you would expect from the Rivas principle either because the labor market is more attractive or because of other uh, assets that large cities can can offer. Um, this is an illustration of this regional inequality uh, in this case from 1855 till present uh, where you have all the regions along this axis there are 21 regions and and the the, the height for each region is the deviation from the average GDP per capita of, of the country. So you see the metropolitan region here, which has always been rather strong. And then there are a few other large cities. But the general pattern, as you see over time during these 150 years, is that this wrinkled surface becomes somewhat less wrinkled. So there is a sort of general tendency to equalization in the spatial dimension. But you should also notice this U-shaped pattern for the metropolitan G region. Um, the, the economic importance of, of large cities is growing again. And we see uh, a partial reversal to the situation that prevailed 150 years ago when, when uh, the large city areas dominated the economic life of, of um, countries. So can we model that? Can we generate that? Um, in a model. Well, this um, reproduces work by Paul Krugman, um, Fujita and Venables. Um, uh, it's a semi-complicated model uh, of two regions that interact. Um, they, there's an agricultural sector and there's a manufacturing sector. And the, the question that we ask is, how will the manufacturing in industry be allocated across these two regions? And what you see here on the on the horizontal axis is the, the share of the manufacturing industry in one of these regions. So 0.5 means that half of the manufacturing industry is located in one region and the other half in the other. It's a symmetric, symmetric pattern. Um, and What's shown here in the diagram is how this allocation pattern depends on transport costs, which will be the driving variable in this model. If transport costs are high, you have the, the, this first curve here. Uh, and you see the, the stable pattern here, the, the, the arrows pointing to the middle. So when transport costs are high, you will get the symmetric um, allocation pattern with uh, uh, one half of the industry in each region. Now, if transport costs then fall, which they have done um, secularly, um, you will get after some time, not one, but five uh, equilibrium points. 
uh, you have the original one, you have an intermediate in, symmetrically, and you have the endpoints here um, where all the manufacturing industry is located at, at uh, one end or the other. The intermediate ones are unstable, so you, in, in reality you have only three points to choose between. And of course, if you start from the original symmetric pattern, um, that point will remain stable. Uh, so that will be the, the um, allocation pattern that you would expect. Um, now, if transport costs drop even further, um, that the stability of that equilibrium point disappears. So there are only two stable points left with zero or one as the points of convergence, which means that the whole of the manufacturing industry will be concentrated to one of the regions and which one will depend on random effects, but, but uh, um, you will not have this uh, symmetric pattern that you had previously. So again, we see this, this symmetry breaking, I mean, from a, an originally stable situation, which is uh, egalitarian in the sense that, that the manufacturing industry is equally distributed, uh, degenerates into a highly asymmetrical pattern of distribution. Okay, so let me return now to where I started uh, with these um, different, uh, three different categories of explanation, um, uh, where you have either uh, an external force that generates inequality uh, or an external for force that is neutral, or uh, the third one, uh, internally generated inequality. And as you see from this table, for all of these three perspectives, individual, social, and spatial, you can find examples that uh, represent uh, this combination between uh, perspective and, and type of, of explanation. I don't have time to, to go through all this, but, but of course, I mean, if you have inheritance, uh, if the parent generation uh, exhibits a uh, highly uh, inegalitarian distribution, uh, of course, that will be inherited by the, the children's generation. Uh, that's trivial. And again, if you start with a highly discriminated uh, society, uh, then that will continue uh, to regenerate. Uh, that's sort of the stability of status quo. Uh, in the spatial case, you could have natural resources like uh, minerals or natural harbors or, or so on that, that favor certain regions over other. This is trivial. This is not very interesting. Uh, more interesting is the, 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 what corresponds to the carbon vortices. That is, you have some sort of external influence, which is not um, inegalitarian by nature, but, but it generates, uh, and I gave the example here of human capital formation, the, the school class where the kids enter with somewhat different uh, uh, human capital in the first class, and that difference then tends to grow uh, over time. The, the most fascinating category is, is the third one here, the, the symmetry breaking category. And, and as you see, the, I've illustrated here, uh, uh, you find uh, these examples of symmetry breaking in, in all three uh, perspectives. Um, the city side distribution can, of course, I mean, that model um, for, for allocation of, of manufacturing can, of course, be generated to the global system of, of um, the economy. Uh, so you have a world system theory which, which uh, can draw upon these. Um, symmetry breaking mechanisms. So a first summary then, um, where do we go from the individual to the social? Um, if we look at sort of natural innate differences, uh, such as body height or, or aptitude tests uh, at a very early age, um, you will typically find normal distributions, which are 
symmetric and, and uh, fairly egalitarian, so to say. Uh, and then when you measure school performance after a number of years in school, they have this more skewed distribution that I illustrated in diagram. In working life, you have this increasing um, uh, spread um, with each cohort as they pass a number of decades in working life. Um, there's also a difference between earnings and, and consumptions. Um, the, the, the consumption pattern is more egalitarian than, than earnings. So the, what the result of that is, of course, that the savings ratio of high income earners is higher than that of low income earners. And as a result of that, you get a distribution of wealth, which is uh, starkly skewed. So a summary of, of all these patterns you see is that the more social, the more unequal. The stronger the social component is, the more we have uh, distanced ourselves from the original physiological distribution, the more equal uh, the distribution becomes. Uh, in other words, um, inequality is to a great extent, the social construction. So what could we say about policy? Well, policy, of course, would require a similar of its own, but I'll just make a few remarks which derive directly from, from the analysis that I presented. Um, in the first place, the, 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 we can equalize. Even if there are strong tendencies to inequality, we can compensate for that in school or, or um, in, in working life with the taxation, transfers, etc. There's in the public debate the tendency to believe that uh, a genetic component is something which um, is um, immune to, to um, interventions. If, it, if something is classified as genetic, you can't do anything about it. Uh, the other, the non-genetic part is, is amenable to, to intervention, which is completely false. Uh, I mean, we know that family background matters a lot for school results, and some of these family factors are tremendously difficult to do anything about. Whereas uh, eyesight uh, problems sometimes uh, have a genetic origin, and they can easily be compensated by, by eyeglasses. So, so that's the, the, this link between genetics and, and social policy is, is mostly false, uh, quite apart from the fact that the genetic component now has been reduced substantially in, in recent years with, with modern uh, genetic research. Um, second uh, general reflection is that feedback from outcomes is necessary. That's the basic theorem in, in, in control theory. You cannot st stabilize an unstable system um, using feed forward only. Uh, you, you have to look at where this state is and, and to feedback um, um, controls from that state. Uh, the, this is relevant actually to the the discussion in the 1970s uh, between the two uh, famous philosophers, John Rawls and, and Robert Nozick, um, that some of you are certainly uh, well acquainted with. Um, um, Nozick tried to design the perfect constitution that would make all differences in a society um, legitimate. And uh, Rawls, uh, uh, for his part, um, laid down a few basic uh, restrictions, um, one of which was that you, you should design a society uh, that is as good as possible for those who are worst off, in, in simple terms. And uh, you can tell, actually, that, that Raw the Rawls approach um, can be successful because he designs what is actually feedback from the outcome, whereas uh, Nozick's design is doomed to failure. 
um, you cannot construct that perfect feed forward uh, constitution that solves the problem of distribution. Um, third point, um, again, the Gini coefficient is inefficient as an indicator uh, and, and sometimes misleading. You need more detailed pictures of actual distributions. And then if you look at such studies, you will find that the, all the interesting parts are in the lower three to four decile groups. That's where, where um, lacks of general uh, confidence in society is born. That's where political populism is born uh, and so on, uh, delinquency, etc. Um, so <clears throat> if you need to focus <clears throat> your interest somewhere, it's on the lower part of the distribution. Um, the time dimension tells us that front-loaded interventions are more efficient. This is John, James Heckman's uh, basic message. Um, um, and of course, sometimes you have um, synergies between uh, various dimensions of inequality that may require coordinated efforts in several areas that holds both for individuals, households, and sometimes whole countries. General summary, uh, point one, equality is unstable. That is why equality, inequality is ubiquitous. Um, um, inequality is not some aberration from uh, a natural state of equality. It's inequality that is that is what you should be expecting, um, which is not to say that it's a natural law, because we can obviously uh, intervene and so change the the actual state of affairs. But but you have to keep this in mind that in the absence of conscious policy to to contain inequality, it will grow. Um, individual differences at birth tend to grow over the life cycle. That's sort of the internal dynamics of individuals and individual development. Uh, and these tendencies are reinforced by a number of social mechanisms, which differ uh, in, in uh, dynamics and, and uh, relevance over the life cycle, but are nonetheless very important. And as a result of these two points, what we observe in, in a given society, the existing inequalities, will always be out of proportion with differences in ability and effort. I mean, in, in some of these symmetry baking models, we assume identical individuals for mathematical simplicity. Now, in reality, of course, individuals are not identical. And so, uh, uh, there will be small differences, but because of these instabilities that I have described, the result of those instabilities will be out of proportion with the actual underlying differences in, in ability and effort. And that sort of delegitimizes a substantial part of, of the inequalities that we observe in a society. And finally, important feedback from the outcome is necessary. We have to look at the actual distributions and feedback using um, education policy, housing policy, taxes and transfers, etc., in order to keep inequality within uh, civilized limits. Then there will always be differences, uh, sort of political taste, on how far we should push this. This um, countervailing uh, effort, but but it needs to be there. There is no such thing as a, a natural society. Um, I'm drawing the line there. I refer those who are interested in, in more detailed pictures of the, the models and the empirics um, to my book, which was published a couple of months ago with, with Springer. So thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for your presentation. I 
would like to have a little bit more on um, on the question of so so why do you think that the uh, that the most important part of um, of the uh, distribution is the lower part because I mean and uh, um, currently there are many projects looking more on richness and and towards the 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 upper part of the um, distribution yes. and arguing that that this is important for for policy measures that we have to look at yeah. the upper part of the distribution so I, I would like you to to qualify a little bit on on that one mm -hmm. sure um, uh, I, I Thank you. should have said a bit more than that but but uh, let me explain um, what, what I mean when I say that the, the lower part is the imp most important part, is that the 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 share of total assets or incomes of those three to four ba basic uh, um, decile groups um, is what decides on the general level of trust in society in, in sort of the general political behavior whether we have strong populism in society and so on so so these broad social and political variables are to a great extent determined by the this uh, asset and income distribution in the lower part this is not to say that the the share of the assets or incomes of the of the upper percent percentage points uh, the the extreme one percent or the upper ten percent is in import unimportant uh, quite to the contrary but it's it's important in a in a different sense because if you have a number of extremely wealthy individuals or households in society that becomes a political problem because these this this small group uh, will exert an unproportional influence over the political institutions in society um, if you have tremendous power in your economic sphere it's difficult to accept that you will be will be reduced to one in individual among millions in the political sphere so so this this category of very wealthy individuals tend to translate their economic power to the political sphere and and that's what we've seen for instance in 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 the american development over the last uh, decades uh, that very wealthy individuals have engaged in the creation of political institutions uh, think tanks and so on uh, in order to uh, influence sort of the the broad political development of the united states and uh, they have been quite successful at that so that's in order to make my my statement a bit more precise <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> Yes. As a master of the Russian language, you'll probably know that in the good old days of Gorbachev, the game that in little children here play called Monopoly was reinvented and renamed because the, the word Monopoly in, in Moscow was, uh, well, that was associated with nasty old capitalism and things. So they changed it to the, to the game of business management, which uh -huh. is... Uh, unlikely to attract, to attract many children. And if we go to the Bible, we will see the old saying, to those who have sh more shall be given, and to those who don't have even the little that they do have will be taken away. And one of the problems, I think, with inequality is that the vice of usury was changed into the virtue of credit by some linguist or whatever uh, and we have the crazy situation where the richer you are the richer you become by doing nothing you just put the money somewhere into yen or yuan or anything and it's earning interest I and mean, it might earn more interest in dollars and less interest in pounds but but it's still earning interest and you it's very difficult once you are so rich to become less rich and hence oligarchs, which brings us back to present day Russia and bad news and Ukraine and so on. And I think we have to somehow 
limit the amount of wealth that any one individual can own, or certainly limit the amount of resources that any one individual can consume. But, uh, Manfred, it, it, it will not work because you see then some company might uh, possess enormous number of resources and they will say that it's not for individual, it's a company, you see, and they will uh, uh, insist upon their political decisions, that's all. Yes, I, I believe uh, the, the, this last remark is, is highly relevant. The, the, uh, the dominance of our social and political life today are not human beings, but uh, juridical persons. Um, sometimes states, uh, but, but uh, to an increasing extent, very large corporations and hybrids between corporations and foundations, uh, funds, uh, and so on. Um, and I think that's the really important change that we have experienced during the last um, well, 200 years, let's say. We have seen a tremendous economic growth, um, increase in wealth, uh, health, expected longevity, and so on, but also a, a tremendous growth of the, of the presence and power of juridical persons, um, physical persons, human beings like you and me, and flesh and blood are very small in comparison to these to these juridical persons and that is the really complicated problem how to control these and 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 how to master this development so that um the corporations the funds and so on do not uh, outgrow states because corporations are not democratic institutions. They, they are agents which are basically dictatorial by design. Um, so um, the perspective of, of corporations governing the world is, is not a healthy one. <laughs> um, but I don't have the recipe for solving it right now. Actually, that's the topic of my next book. So, so uh, let me come back in a few years and on that. <laughs> Well, can you tell me about migration? If low-income immigrants come to your country, that affects inequality in the country. Your country has been very generous to low-income immigrants for many years. And then recently the policy of Sweden changed. Well, yes, I mean, migration, again, that's worth another seminar uh, in its own right. Uh, but let me say a few words. Um, um, in the first place, the, the, the share of the world's population which migrates is fairly small. We are talking about parts of a percent or so who migrate. So. Um, um, in, in, in numbers, it's 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 limited amount of the total population. But of course, they can be highly important if they concentrate, which they tend to do. Um, and and um, the the general effect of migration is, of course, some form of equalization. People migrate because they expect to find better economic conditions in the in the other country to which they migrate. Uh, so, I mean, the, if they are right in their assumption, there's a sort of inherent equalization process going on. And of course, they reach the new country and most of them end up in a poorer state than, than the average citizen in the, in the country to which they, they migrate. So th those are the simple uh, facts. Numbers play a role. Actually, my country, Sweden, um, has received more immigrants during the last 15, 20 years than any other EU country in, in relation to its population. 
uh, actually right now 25% or somewhat more of the Swedish population has a foreign origin uh, as defined by, by the official statistics bureau. Um, they are either born abroad or they are born in Sweden but with both parents born abroad. So from a situation going back say three, four decades when the Swedish population was fairly homogenous, uh, we have reached a, a highly heterogeneous situation with uh, fairly large disparities um, in income, uh, obviously. Um, what is worrying um, in the longer time perspective is that this category, um, I mean, the young ones in belonging to this category tend to get um, less human capital uh, that they bring into the, their adult lives. I mean, schools for immigrant children do not reach the same quality as average schools. And I think that holds for most immigrant countries uh, across Europe. And that's because they tend to concentrate in certain areas. It's difficult to recruit professors, uh, teachers uh, to those areas. Um, um, and so they, they, they reach uh, adult age uh, poorly equipped for working life. And of course, in such situations, the, the temptation to, to uh, go for a criminal career instead of, of a normal working life is, is near at hand. Th those are similar problems in, in, in uh, most immigrant countries. Um, yeah, I guess that's, you could say in, in very general terms. Um, I, I'm personally very worried about this longer time perspective uh, and, and because of this human capital dimension, because that tends to decide um, the outcome for, for young people over the very long time horizon. And, and it's very difficult to, to um, repair in adult life because of this hectic... Well, can I re-ask my question? My question was, did, did, did your country invite inequality? Was it a surprise <laughs> that the consequence of the policy was greater inequality? No, but the, the, again, that's, that's a question of numbers. Uh, uh, we, had a, we had a fairly strong immigration in the 1960s and the 1970s from Greece and Turkey there was a shortage of labor in the Swedish manufacturing industry. They could arrive here in Sweden, they would start working at Volvo in Gothenburg or some other uh, manufacturing industry next week, and, and th there was no problem. And some of them remained in Sweden, some of them returned to Greece or Turkey after spending 20, 30 years in Sweden and with a handsome uh, bank account as a result. Um, so. Um, large numbers, um, immigrants with often uh, much poorer educational status on arrival than, than previously. I mean, we have basically illiterate immigrants from Somalia, Ethiopia, and so on. Uh, and that's, of course, a much trickier group to take care of. They, it takes a huge um, investment in human capital to raise them to the average level of human capital in, in society. So you will get inequality as a result, uh, more or less mathematical result. May I um, add a few remarks and questions perhaps? Um, yeah. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, just a few remarks uh, regarding uh, the history of the subject, so to speak. I mean, I mentioned uh, Rousseau uh, and the two major propositions in Rousseau's rather complex argument are first, nature is not the source of social inequality, 
And secondly, amour propre, self-love, as a catchphrase, is the source. So, I mean, people's uh, intention to get richer and their ability uh, to become so is, is, a, is a very important course uh, of that story in, in Rousseau. Now, Adam Smith took up some of the arguments and your summary account of your own argument uh, strikes me as coming very close to Smith's overall message. Uh, we could run through the various items on your list and I think each and every one finds uh, some equivalence in Smith's argument. I mean, it is very clear that Smith was not of the opinion and that is, I think, very important for what we uh, experienced in more recent times, namely the increase in inequality, income inequality, um, that markets are both efficient and just. If you have the opinion that they are efficient and just, why should you do anything? I mean, of course, that is, that is the message uh, conveyed by uh, those who are rich, <laughs> Uh, maybe not so much by those who are poor and uh, of course uh, the proof that they are just has never been properly given I would say. So uh, Smith was not of this opinion therefore he was very much uh, convinced uh, that the state had to play a role in controlling in particular the wretched spirit of monopoly as he called it. I mean the monopolization of the economic system and the um, accumulation of uh, super normal profits that was a, a big problem to him um, and of course we are facing that again today now uh, you did not mention um, one author uh, and in his footsteps uh, Piketty uh, who pointed out very clearly and gave I think uh, compelling evidence in support of his argument that the increase in inequality uh, after say uh, the Great Depression, uh, the, the decrease in inequality was very much due to tax policy. Uh, Tony Atkinson. Tony Atkinson, I think, is, is perhaps the author which uh, had a lot of, I think, very useful things to say about inequality and how to, how to combat it. And I think in modern times, this um, uh, need, I think, to to look at the system, the dynamics, which is very much driven nowadays by what are called superstar firms, who benefit tremendously from artificial intelligence and the built-in mechanism of dynamically increasing returns to scale, that will, I think, uh, uh, make inequality even rise to hitherto uh, unknown extents. Unless, I mean, economic policy and especially also Justice policy, uh, sorry, tax policy and, um, and taxation of uh, property and, and wealth will be uh, brought back uh, in, into the picture. Thanks. Well, uh, <clears throat> I can, can calm you that if you read my book, you will find that I quote both Rousseau and Smith in the book. So, so I'm well aware. <laughs> I'm well aware of this and, and particularly. Hmm? Uh, I'm, I'm, good. By the way, uh, Smith's uh, text, um, which unfortunately very few people today have read. I mean, most people who refer to Adam Smith, they they see him basically as a prophet of the market uh, with with uh, no restraints. I mean, and, and, but if you read the text, you find. Uh, quite uh, dedicated parts where he argues against the unfair legislation which prohibits organization of labor, whereas it does not prohibit uh, well, the, the organization of the landlords and so on. So, so there was definitely uh, a social uh, engagement uh, in, in, in his uh, writing. And of, and of course, he wrote the theory of moral sentiments before the, the Wealth of Nations and, and those two books uh, make a couple. So, so you should read both to get a picture of, obviously. Um, I, I 
because time was limited, I abstain from going into this this argument uh, about uh, what to do about it. I mean, I have made some short remarks on policy, but but uh, if you read chapter nine of my book, which is the longest chapter, there there are uh, several um, summaries of the literature which I find uh, support a an egalitarian policy in general. I mean, if we take the, the 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 classical debate, is inequality good for economic growth or not? I mean, if you go back four or five decades in time, most economists took it for granted that inequality is good for growth because inequality creates incentives and incentives are good for growth. So it, it, that's so self-evident you don't even have to look at, at the data. Now, after some time, uh, a few economists did look at the data. Actually, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Torsten Persson here at the Stockholm University, uh, wrote a paper in the early 90s together with, with um, Guido Tabellini, um, where they asked the question, uh, is inequality bad for growth? And then we have seen an increasing literature um, in the commission that I chaired few years ago, we made a literature survey. Uh, we found something like 35 articles and reports on this topic. Uh, and we found also that most of the authors, most of the economists analyzing this nexus between inequality and growth were rather lazy because they used only the Gini coefficient as a measure of inequality. And I showed you earlier that that the Gini coefficient is an extremely blunt tool. You can't expect any stable statistical results if you use the Gini coefficient as indicator. Uh, a handful of studies are more detailed. They, they go down into the, the shares of incomes of decile groups and, and um, quintile groups. Uh, and this small group is almost unanimous on the conclusion that equality is good for growth, inequality is bad for growth. So the larger the share of the lower strata, the higher is the growth rate. And there is actually a minus sign uh, in front of the income share of the highest decile group, um, which uh, Joseph Stiglitz has. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz had written a paper about that, um, showing that that the richest part of the population tends to place its assets in non-productive non -productive activities when it becomes very rich. So again, it's no mystery, this result, but it took something like 40, 50 years for the uh, economic profession to, to find it. So, but I have a number of of um, summaries of the literature that that have this general message that that the equality is probably the thing to aim for, even if you care only about efficiency, growth rates, and so on. Thank you once again, and looking forward to see you in the next uh, Adam Smith seminary in autumn, I think. Enjoy the summertime, and. Uh, okay. okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you.